Hello there. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I always like to tell the story of how I first came to Oxford. Uh, it gets a bit boring if you've heard it as many times as some other people. Uh, because the first time I arrived, I came in handcuffs. Uh, and it, I wasn't on my way to an S&M party. I was on my way to a boys' prison, which was just outside Oxford. Uh, so I kind of look upon myself as an old Oxonian because I got part of my education here. <laughs> uh, what I want to talk about today, in I don't think we've got an awful lot of time. We've got about, what, half an hour, three quarters of an hour? And then questions and answers. And questions and answers are sometimes a pretty good part of the... I mean, some questions are crap. <laughs> uh, because, you know, people think, oh, I've got to ask a question. Uh, uh, because I've got to look good. Uh, I do this. I go to lectures and I think, what can I ask? So I say, you know, where did you get that tie from? Or something like that. Anyway, um, I want to talk about PEC because though I'm here to talk about social entrepreneurism, I want to explain that I fell into social entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism by mistake. Um, I was a, a, a printer and a publisher. I printed magazines uh, for all sorts of people like the Tate Gallery and an airline called Pan American. I printed their in-flight magazine, one of the first ever done. Uh, it's no longer here. So I was a kind of social entrepreneur, sorry, I was a business entrepreneur. I was always trying to create business. Uh, and then what happened was Gordon Roddick of The Body Shop who gave me the money to start The Big Issue, whose idea it was to start a street paper in the UK because he had seen one in America and he'd seen uh, people who were using the paper to get out of trouble, selling the paper, earning a bit of money, turning into kind of little traders rather than beggars and thieves. Uh, and he wanted to start the street paper. So he was the guy who, uh, who asked me to, uh, to, to, to start the street paper. Um, in, it's almost 23 years ago now. Uh, this time, 23 years ago, I was negotiating money from the body shop to pay for the, the creation of a street paper which didn't even have its name. Uh, interestingly, Gordon and I were united in, in an experience. Uh, Gordon was very, very determined that he didn't want to create another charity because there were 501 homeless charities in London alone. We were looking at London specifically. Uh, 501 homeless organisations in London alone who gave the homeless everything from places to sleep, places to wash, everything through to condoms. They were handing out condoms and they were handing out sandwiches and every conceivable thing that you could imagine was being given to homeless people with the exception of the opportunity of making their own money. The way that the British Charitable Foundation, the structure, uh, was, which is Victorian, was always based on the idea that, the, that I don't know if you've ever read Jane Austen, Jane Austen, or, or, or you know, read all Tro Trollope and Dickens and all that. There's always these very, very well-intentioned people who've got a shed load of money, and they go down into the parish and they give things out. So charity grew out of uh, a, a, a noblesse oblige, uh, a, a sense of the superiority of people with a bit of money that they could hand out. And actually, it was very much a part of the spirit of being posh, middle class, upper class, whatever, that you would give a, a very infinitesimal part of your wealth away uh, so that it kind of balanced you. And actually, it might help you when you die and you go to heaven. So there's a kind of system. That means you work people almost to death and then you give them a little bit. And when the people, when you all, when you do work some of them to death, you look after the children by giving them a little bit of money and parochial help and all that. So Gordon uh, and I didn't want to start a charity. Uh, we wanted to give the homeless the chance of making their own money so that they could stand on their own two feet. Gordon, because he was a businessman, 
uh, and this body shop had spread all over the world. Me, because I had been in part of my life uh, brought up in a charitable uh, orphanage by the church, of the, the, um, the Catholic Church, where uh, I was always reminded almost every day that but for the hard work of Catholics in the parish, you wouldn't be here having clean underwear, having three meals a day, having uh, baths and schooling and all sorts of things like that. So I didn't quite get into the kind of charity thing. Also, I was a Marxist, Leninist, Engelist, Trotskyist. And, and Trotskyism and Marxism always rejected what they call short-termism or, or, or radical reformism. So I had this kind of background of being a Catholic who was against Catholic giving and a Marxist who was against anything which was a, what you might call a palliative that didn't dismantle the causes of poverty and all that stuff. Anyway, but by the time I'd met Gordon Roddick, I'd got rid of all that shit. I'd become, I'd moved from, I'd moved from uh, being uh, a person who was controlled by ideology into a person who kept asking these questions. And my big question was, why was it that I had managed to get out of the sticky stuff, had managed to get out of problems, poverty, homelessness, racism. I was a, I, I love telling people, I, I love telling people about the times that I used to hate blacks, Jews, Indians, uh, and all sorts of people because I got out of it, because when you get out of it, you suddenly start ascending almost bodily into the air because you feel kind of a lot lighter because you get rid of that kind of British imperialism crap, uh, as you know. Anyway, that's just an aside. Got nothing at all to do with today's discussion and certainly got nothing to do with pep, pet, peck. Anyway, so Gordon gave me the money. I wanted to create... Oh, sorry, there's a few children here, so I won't swear. Um, can you get rid of them so I can swear? <laughs> oh, I want to swear! I went to see a comic last night called Mark Thomas. Anybody heard of, heard of him? What a load of crap. What an absolute load of crap. <laughs> crap is quite a clean word. <laughs> he, he, he had an audience of about 700 people, all of them saying, th all of them really excited because he was going to change the world because he would issue little stickers that you went in and you put on books in bookshops saying, uh, you c available cheaper at a local charity shop, you know, undermine capitalism uh, and all that stuff. I, th I thought it was an appalling evening and it's greatly affected me. 24 hours later, I've been thinking to myself, how can some people in this world who call themselves intelligent, and they are, and call themselves educated, and they are, and they waste so much time on doing stupid little almost schoolboy. It's like when I was a boy, we used to love stink bombs and getting on a train and a bus because you'd throw stink bombs in and you'd crush, crush them and then suddenly everybody thinks, who's farted? And it was like as though the biggest elephant in the world had come in and passed wind. And we love that, but I, I don't think you're going to change anything, are you? You're not going to improve humanity by leaving farty smells around. Anyway, uh, that's, just a, that's just an aside. I am, by the way, a stand-up comic. And the older I get, the more funny I am. I find I'm really weird. Uh, but, and I said to, uh, I, I said to, to Riddy, I mean, you, you know, when you put me on stage, you take a risk. I'm also likely to take my clothes off. No, 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 there's, <laughs> there's no way. I used to, when I was young, people paid me to take my clothes off. Now I'm paid to keep them on, so... That's the only difference about age. You know, they say, keep the clothes on. Um, so anyway, so we didn't want to start a charity and we fell into this weird world because if you wanted to start a charity, you couldn't give people work. You could not employ people. You could not create. The, you could give them training. You could give them counselling. You could do everything. You could give them clean environments and everything, sandwiches, but you couldn't give them work. Now, isn't it weird? 
that if you want to transform somebody, you'd have thought the best thing to, to, for transformation is kind of self-transformation, which is you give somebody the opportunity of making money so that they can then begin the process themselves. Is that a critic or <laughs> a beautiful young boy who... Shall I sing you a song? <laughs> I can sing. I, but you'd never believe it, but I'm a young father. You know, I keep saying to people, I said, even though I don't look like a young father, and I don't walk like one, I'm a young father. I've got very young children. I've got a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old. I'm one of those beautiful older gentlemen who improve with antiquity. <laughs> and there's a lot of very short-sighted women out there, <laughs> including my current wife. Anyway, uh, so if you want to give work, you have to move away from charitable giving, which suited me. So we end up in this strange world, which wasn't quite defined, called social entrepreneurism or social enterprise. There were a number of them out there, but nobody had codified it. There wasn't any university departments who had it on the agenda, the curriculum. So I said to Gordon, well, what, why don't we just, what we'll do is we'll, we'll create a business, we'll make it very business-like, and then we'll create the t articles and terms of association, or whatever it's called, and tie ourselves down so that all the profits went back into the company or went into the well-being of, of the disenfranchised by creating work and opportunity. And Gordon said, yeah, that's a great idea. So we, we kind of concocted this cock-up because uh, uh, even though it's perfect and, and the t articles, terms and articles of our association means that even though I was the shareholder, I was the person who decided life and death within the company. I couldn't then, if I made an extra 100,000, nick 50,000 and put it in my bin. I just had to live every month and every year. I mean, I was only getting 850,000 pounds a year. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I was just sneaking that through. Now, unfortunately, I have said that on occasions, and it has been repeated, that Johnny Bird's on a big screw. I have a wage, that's it. Anyway, so we stumbled into entrepreneurism. And I woke up and I found myself an entrepreneur. And there weren't many other people. And then suddenly, other people came along. And you know, uh, pioneers die and settlers prosper, because soon there were people who prospered. There, were, there was a school for social entrepreneurs started, and then there was this university department here and university department here, and everywhere was talking about social entrepreneurs and social, and they were using us. The amount of people have written about me and used me as a case study and used the big issue as a case study. They haven't even come anywhere near me. And they've got silly sods all over the place buying their books and doing all that stuff based on the fact that they've used our model. And all they did was just look at our website and look at our books and realise. So anyway, so we stumbled into something which we didn't quite understand, which was something, it wasn't business, but it was. It wasn't charity, but it was, because it was intended for the good of individuals. It was this kind of no man's land called social enterprise. And so I arrived in a social enterprise uh, not particularly happy with uh, the world that we encountered because, as I said, there were 501 homeless organisations and they weren't being innovative with the homeless. They weren't being entrepreneurial. They didn't look upon the homeless as people who really should be given opportunities. And the reason for that is because what charity does is it creates a concept of them and us. Intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and, and that is one of the greatest crimes perpetrated against the poor. What you do is you look and you establish a poor person. Now, there's a young lady here. We'll 
hello, I'm going to look upon you as a poor person. So you're a poor person, so what does she need? She needs clothes and she needs shelter. And, she, and I give all the stuff to her and uh, she's improved and, and then I give her a bit of opportunity, better training and all sorts of things. But what it is, is it's a superior human being looking at an inferior human being. Now, if you go around the world thinking that you're superior and other people are inferior, I, you can get away with that if actually you're meeting people who are ignorant and stupid through their own efforts, but if they're born into poverty and they never get anywhere near a school, why would you look upon them as inferior to yourself? Because you've probably got all sorts of opportunities that they haven't. In a real world, you're equal. That is, you make the most of the circumstances that you're in. But poverty are, and its responses around charity are often about them and us. As though the poorest in the world are of another species. And I always think, when I listen to some of the ways that people talk about the poor and the gap between rich and poor, which we are all, all feeling very angry about. Whenever I meet people, they're always going, that gap between rich and poor, it's disgusting. And I say, do you know anything about it? Or is it just what you read in The Guardian? The gap between rich and poor. What do you know? Anyway, so, you look, so when I listen to some of these programs to get people out of poverty, I kind of close my eyes and think, are they talking about getting human beings out of poverty? Or are they talking about white rhinos getting them out of poverty? Or are they talking about pink flamingos or blue whales? Because I get this strong feeling that they're not actually talking about the human species. They're talking, I wouldn't say they're talking necessarily about a subspecies, but they're talking about another species. And actually, if you look at the way that the world has developed over the last 150 years, it has largely been white people looking at people who are dark and saying, what can we do for them? Should we build them their own compound so they can run around and like a white rhino and get a load of or bamboos or whatever they eat? Uh, so, so you've got these ideological, cultural, philosophical, I was going to say gynecological, but I don't know what it means. Uh, you've got these, all these ologies going on there at the same time. And that if you encounter poverty, either sentimentally, there's a lot of people, the, the people who look upon it and say, oh, well, we've got to really help these people, uh, are often well-intentioned, but look upon them, as I said, as an other... Or, or there's the sentimental people. And the sentimental people will never allow you anywhere near the poor, those in poverty, to bring about a transformation in their lives because that would mean you would have to break that gap between superior and inferior. And, and even the most... I mean, it, imagine it. If, if there was no poverty, you'd have loads of pop stars taking even more drugs because they'd be lost. What would they do with their spare time? They wouldn't be able to go into Africa and adopt children. They'd have to, do, they'd have to come up with some other gimmick, wouldn't they? Think of all those companies that couldn't make themselves look good because of their CSR program, because suddenly poverty disappeared. Anyway, I digress. But that's me, John Digress Bird. So I fell into social entrepreneurism, but here I am. The first thing I did was I gave the homeless a legitimate means of making money based exclusively on my own experience. Because I found that whenever I was on the run from the police and getting involved in all sorts of crime, if I got the chance of making some honest money for a period of time, like an island, an oasis of sanity, I would um, get, a I'd get a job and I'd earn a bit of money, I'd get straight and I'd pay rent and all that sort of stuff. And, and I realised that if you could take people who were getting into crime because they were 
doing all sorts of rotten things to themselves, that if you got them out of crime and feeding their very bad habits, but only hurting themselves in the process, would that be wonderful? So what you'd do is you'd have all sorts of people who were harming themselves and harming you and harming your mother and your father because they were mugging you or breaking into your house. So if you, if you took them out of making crime to feed their bad habits and gave them work to do it, which is, as we know, counterintuitive or whatever you call it, then you might actually begin a process of reconstructing their lives because you were decriminalizing. Anyway, we did all that stuff. It was very, very... It has not been equaled. Here we are, nearly 23 years later, and the British government has spent the last 20 years pushing more and more people into social security and all forms of dependency. Between 2000 and 2010, the amount of people who received social security rather than social opportunity increased in the UK by 35 to 40%. Incredible. And a lot of those people were the working poor. So instead of putting money into them so that they could skill up and move out of the poor jobs or skill up people in social security so that they could get themselves and them them and themselves out of poverty by investing in them and giving them opportunity in education. We didn't do that. We just warehoused them. And at the same time, the big issue was struggling to fill people with the idea that what you need to do is you need to give homeless people a hand up, not a hand out. And that still is revolutionary. I was asked by a Taiwanese magazine newspaper yesterday, they said, what do you think is the biggest problem that you've faced in the last 22 years? I said, the biggest problem is the asinine thinking of governments. That's why what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get into the government. Because as you can tell, I'm a very beautiful butterfly. I mean, I know, I know I'm a very beautiful bird. I'm a very beautiful butterfly. I'm, I'm wonderful if you look at my profile. Wonderful, all the wonderful things he's done. But you know, I'm just one of thousands and thousands of butterflies who are thinking outside the box. Until we actually change the thinking within the box, we're really a bit of a floor show. Do you get that? All right? Shall I go now or shall I come now? <laughs> Joke time? What are you going to... Were you going to... What? Q and A. Q and A. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> We've got until nine, haven't we? Sorry, can I, can I, you can please ask me questions, but I need to get this out of the way. Otherwise, it's like constipation, you know, as you know, it's not to be recommended at my age. So anyway, or any age, actually. Uh, so, so I came along to give homeless people a hand up, not a hand out. Peck, that's what I really wanted to talk about. And all the other stuff is just a load of preparation. Hot air. Peck. Prevention. Emergency. Coping. Cure. Prevention is where mummy and daddy give you ballet lessons and piano lessons and things. You go, what the hell is this all about? You know, and you're doing all this as your five-year-old, eight-year-old thing. Jesus Christ, what are they doing with me? Well, I want to be a, a, I want to work at Goldman Sachs, you know. <laughs> he represents the coming home, the ending of the diaspora. It's rubbish. When you have all this appearance, when Obama, the first thing he does is he fills his, he fills his, uh, um, his cabinet with graduates from Yale and Harvard Business School and all that. No real people there, I assure you. And I know the people, because one of them is an ex-cousin of mine, ex-cousin-in-law. When you have all this kind of appearance, 
then you have to realize that one of the reasons we're ending up with an Obama or a Cameron or whatever is because we are not participating in democracy. We're leaving it to the representational democracy, and that is why the world is going down the tubes. Uh, my big issue is around that. I have a number of other big issues around education. Why is it that schooling in the UK, in the US, and in France, and all these other countries that I know about, you have an incredible high level of failure rate amongst 30%? that school doesn't work for 30%, and it's that 30% that always stuck in poverty, always get the crap jobs, always end up in the streets, always end up in crime, always end up in the A&E with all sorts of problems around drinking and smoking and obesity. This predictability of failure. Where is the great brains coming together to dismantle poverty? Where are the great universities that are putting their heads together? Instead, leaving it to a guy like me who says, look, the system stinks because most of you are spending your time piss-balling around with just making poverty more acceptable. Why isn't Oxford and Cambridge, why is this generation of young people saying, we've had enough of poverty? And they're saying, oh, you know, what can I do? Oh, I'll go and help a little group here or a little group there. And that is my big issue. My big issue, I got into the middle class and I found them dumb. And I found I've never met an educated person who wasn't more educated, less educated than me. And therefore, and I do also have a Napoleonic complex, I'm sorry. And I was thrown out of many places. God bless you, sorry, thank you.